Income Tax 2023-2024 Dispositions of Business Property Tax Software Example Get ready and some coffee because we need extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024 Here we are First, a word from our sponsor Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In our form 1040 example problems using LaCert Tax Software, you don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, starting at our standard store starting point taxpayer adam taxman just trying to avoid a dang taxman living in beverly hills 90210 single filer no dependents we're starting this time with the schedule c sole proprietor business which ultimately rolls into line number eight additional income from schedule one the schedule one over here is the additional income and adjustments to income part number one line number three is where we have business income or loss from the schedule c if we then go to the schedule c called the profit or loss from business we have an income statement format to the schedule business income currently at 120,000 in this example problem minus the expenses or business deductions 20,000 so far that gets us in essence to our net business income the 100,000 which is what is pulling into the schedule one and then into the form 1040 line number eight we also note that we're gonna have to deal with self-employment taxes with our schedule c so that's on the schedule se where we take the bottom line and then apply the social security and medicare basically employee and employer portion to it getting to the tax of 14229 so if i go to my form 1040 page number two we now have the federal income tax plus the other tax which is going to be the self-employment tax coming from schedule two so that came from this schedule additional taxes part number two self-employment tax there's the 14129 that's coming from the schedule se also if we go to the schedule se we get to have half of that tax deductible that's going to be 7065 you would think that would go on the schedule c but no because that would make a circle reference therefore instead it goes to the schedule one page number two where we have part two adjustments to income line 15 deductible part of self-employment tax there's the 7065 which ultimately goes to the form 1040 as an adjustment to income or above the line deduction that gives us the 100,000 minus the 7065 gives us the adjusted gross income 92,935 standard deduction we're going to say is for the single filer the 13,850 we also have the system calculating for us the qualified business income deduction from form 8995 15,817 subtotal 29,667 to get finally to the taxable income the 63 uh, 268 and then page two calculating both the federal income tax 9228 and the social the social security and medicare the, the self-employment taxes for a total tax of 23 357 
So that is our starting point. So now, of course, our focus is over here on the Schedule C. And we noted that when we first start the Schedule C, we might choose or we need to choose an accounting method, typically a cash or accrual method, or possibly some other method, some combination of the two methods. Noting cash method is typically easier to do. However, certain types of businesses force us to do accrual things, in which case the code sometimes might force us to go away from a cash-based method. The most common example of that being inventory, because if we track inventory, we can't just expense it when we buy it, but rather put it on the books as an asset, which is an accrual thing to do as opposed to a cash-based thing to do. And then we would uh, expense it as we consume it in the form of cost of goods sold. So that's one of the deviations if we deal with accounts receivable or accounts payable, more likely accounts receivable for small businesses, then we might have to do the accrual thing in that case as well, because we're basically tracking our uh, income on an accrual basis. So you see we have the 120,000 income minus the expenses. Now, the two things that we might have to say capitalize, and when I say capitalize in this sense, I'm saying instead of expensing it, possibly when we pay for it, we put it on the books as an asset and therefore have to do an accrual thing. One is going to be inventory and two is going to be depreciable assets like property, plant and equipment. So let's first just take a quick look at the inventory. So if I go to page number two, you see we have a cost of goods sold calculation. Note what we do not have here. We don't have a balance sheet, but certain things have balance sheet items on them. So when I do a cost of goods sold calculation, it's going to include the beginning inventory. We're assuming at the beginning of the year and ending inventory in the calculation and that those two accounts are basically balance sheet accounts or inventory is a balance sheet account. And when we deal with depreciation, although we don't have a balance sheet, we do have a depreciation schedule, which is tracking the balance sheet accounts of the fixed assets and the accumulated depreciation. So let's imagine that we had to deal with this cost of goods sold. If you have cost of goods sold, then you might be using some kind of software to help you to do your books so that you can get the income statement to help you populate into the Schedule C. So if you were to do that, you might already have a number for cost of goods sold because it's on your income statement. So you might be able to actually fill out this part of the form and say, I could just plug cost of goods sold in right here. What you don't have possibly is the cost of goods sold calculation because that calculation for taxes is on a periodic system for the entire year, basically. So in other words, you might have to, you might need to like back into that number. You might be in this problem saying, I know what this number should be, but I need to then back into the beginning and in, or, you know, this calculation so I can put this page number two because I have to deal with inventory. So let's just imagine, you know, that was the situation. Let's imagine that this in inventory was, uh, was let's say 30,000 of inventory for the cost of goods sold. Well, if I was to jump to that data input and I'm gonna go, let's go to that data input. It won't let me jump there. If I go to my income statement, schedule C, I have the cost of goods sold calculation. Now, now, if I didn't have any beginning inventory, I could start by saying, hey, look, I'm just going to put the number in that I know it should be 30,000, let's say, and then I'm going to go back on over here and there's the 30,000 and that will allow me to tie out my ending balance to what I had on my worksheet. But the page two doesn't really make sense because you don't have any beginning number and uh, ending number. So that's going to kind of confuse the IRS, right? They're going to say, hey, there should be an issue. What should the beginning number be? It should be the same number as it was last year for the ending number. So in other words, if I go back to this software again, you might say, hey, look, the, the beginning number, if I rolled this forward, is going to be same as the ending number last year. So it might already be populated. Let's say it was 5,000 that was already in here. Well, then if I put 30,000 in place, it's going to calculate 35,000 
and that's going to make it so I can't even I can't even reconcile because now it's at 35,000 and I want it to be at 30,000. So you might first say, hey, look, I'm just going to make this work and then I'm going to go back in and fix my cost of goods sold calculation. So I'm going to say, I'm going to make this work so I can get my net income correct and then I'll go fix page two. How could I do that? Well, I don't want to adjust the beginning balance number there. I'm just going to put the same ending number so that if I started and stopped at the same point, then the 30,000 is what is going to populate here. And so now I can say, okay, that number is correct. And I can get to my bottom line net income. And then I could go to page two and say, okay, can I, I need to fix this schedule to be in alignment with this cost of goods sold calculation that the, that the IRS wants to have. So they can kind of give a double verification of the beginning and ending balances of inventory on a periodic system even though my software might be using like a perpetual inventory system. So then I'm left with this problem. Now, if I go back on over here, just a quick look at this, what's this cost of goods sold calculation? It goes like this, beginning inventory. This is the, the short form plus uh, purchases. And that's gonna give us the cost of goods available for sale. That's what we could have sold during the year less, let's say minus ending in inventory. I'm probably spelling this wrong. Oh man, it doesn't like that I had an equal sign there. Get over it, man. This is gonna be plus, and this is gonna be uh, equals the cost of goods sold or COGS. So if I say the begin, if I know the beginning inventory, then what I don't know is this, is this 5,000, is this uh, purchases. I actually do know the cost of goods sold. Like, so because, because that was calculated in my software, possibly on a perpetual method. So I know the 30,000, right? And then the ending inventory I should know the ending inventory because my software would also give me that on the balance sheet. It wouldn't be on the on the income statement, but that's something I should be able to look on the balance sheet and pick that up. So let's say that it was 6,000 and what, wait, wait, hold on. I don't know the cost of goods available for sale. I know the cost of goods sold, which was, I said 30,000. And this is just a subtotal, which is going to be this plus the purchases. So, right. So we can, we can do this calculation and try to back into this number. If I take out this subtotal, of course, what we end up is, is beginning inventory plus purchases is less minus, uh, ending in inventory is going to equal cost of goods sold. So if I put these same numbers in here, I have the five. I don't know what this is. That's going to be X. And then ending inventory is the six. And I actually know uh, the cost of goods sold. So duh, 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 the cost of goods sold is this. So then the question is, what is going to be the purchases in order to figure that out? And if I write this out algebraically, we would have 5,000 plus X minus 6,000 is going to equal the 30,000. And then, of course, we can solve for X. And that's going to be, let me see, what, what's that going to be? That's going to be, this is going to be equal to 30,000. And then I would subtract this from both sides. So minus 5,000 and then add this to both sides plus 6,000. So this should be uh, 31,000, we're going to say, let's double check that. So it'd be 5,000, 31,000, and then 6,000. That means this would be equal to the beginning balance plus purchases minus ending inventory gets us to the 30,000. So then I can go back in here and say, okay, let's, let me fix this cost of goods sold to tie out to, to, uh, my worksheet cost of goods sold is going to be the beginning balance of 5,000, but the purchases need to be, we're going to say 31,000, 31,000, because the ending inventory is 6,000. 
And if I go back on over, so now I come up with the same 30,000 and now my beginning balance is correct. And hopefully I have the right breakout between these two items. So that's just logistics, logistically what you might need to do from a data input standpoint on inventory. Because like I say, this is basically on a periodic inventory system and the IRS is trying to tie into last year's ending inventory to be the beginning balance, pulling in a balance sheet account and having a proper categorization or calculation of ending inventory, which means you actually might have to back in because you might be using a perpetual inventory system. Now, if you have a job cost system, then you have work in process and so on. And it's a little bit more complex because you have to deal with materials and labor and whatnot as part of your cost of goods sold. But a similar concept might apply because you'll be doing that calculation, hopefully in your software. And then you have to basically put it in a format here that is appropriate for the cost of goods sold calculation, which you might do actually after you do the data input for the tax for the for the first page because i'm just going to try to get this number to be correct first just from a data input standpoint to get my net income correct and then i'm going to note that i'm going to shore that number up in the in the supporting schedule making sure that it still results in the same ending number that's on the income statement okay so that's one thing that we might have to capitalize in a little bit of logistics related to it the other is going to be the if I purchase something that's a large thing, I can't just expense it, but have to put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it, which we'll talk a lot more about depreciation in the future. Right now, we just want to take a look at the sales side of things. So, for example, let's say we bought like equipment. I'm going to go over here and say that we bought to do, do, do and we're going to say it's depreciable stuff, depreciable stuff. Do, 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 do. And I'm just going to call it five year property for now. We'll get into how, how long you have to depreciate it and so on later. It's going to the schedule C and it's going to be business one. The category I'm going to call it is going to be then I'm going to put it into machinery. We're going to say, let's start putting it as if we bought, bought it in the current year, 2023. So I'm going to say 06, 06. 23 and let's say we bought it for ten thousand dollars and i'm not going to put anything in for the 179 the method we're going to say is five years makers for office equipment rental and so on and let's just see how that populates we're going to go to the forms and you can see in here we've got the depreciation now populating at eight thousand four hundred even though i put it on the books at ten thousand if I go to my depreciation schedules, now we've basically capitalized it because we put it on the books as an asset and then expensed it. If I look at the regular depreciation, which is a little bit smaller schedule, we've got uh, the 10,000 that it was put on the books for. Note that it took this special depreciation, which we'll talk more about later. This is a deviation from normal accounting practices. And so, so in other words, normally what happens is you're putting it on the books as an asset so that you can uh, expense it all over the useful life, which is an accrual concept. But then the IRS code is keeps on trying to say, hey, look, we would like to have special depreciation because it's popular to do that, number one, because people like that, right? That's going to stick. And two, they're saying the argument is that it stimulates the economy if you can deduct more in the prior in the current year. So they actually defeat their own purpose of putting on the books as an asset by basically allowing almost all of it to be depreciated right in the current year. So, so that's the general idea. We'll get into those different depreciation methods, makers depreciation, types of depreciation assets, property, planting equipment, how it should be categorized and whatnot in a future presentation in more detail. For now, we wanna think about what would happen if we disposed of some property that is already on the books. Now, just a couple other things to note since we're here on the depreciation. One is that you would never wanna put the depreciation on the books for just a five-year property because I can't identify that property to what's actually physically in the business, which isn't so much of a problem when I first put it on the books 
But imagine what happens when I dispose of this property now. I can't dispose of it because I don't know which property I disposed of. Or I can dispose of it, but I can't take it off of the schedule because I can't identify it. So it becomes a problem down the road. We also have to be careful about grouping depreciable items into one group. So if I bought like 10 computers, if I put them all on the books as 10 computers, then again, that'll be fine for the current year. But if I dispose of one or two computers in the future, how am I going to take one or two computers off the books, off the depreciation schedule when they're on there in one line item? Right. So what we want to do is break out each piece of equipment, physical piece in our depreciation schedule so that in the future, when we dispose of them, it will be easy for us to select the item that's being disposed of and account for it. It's already hard enough to deal with dispose dispositions of property without the added problem of not being able to identify the property on the worksheet because of these because we didn't put it on there clearly. We would also like to have our categories here on the depreciation schedule to be supporting the same category structure on the software, such as like a QuickBooks, for example. And that will once again, make it easier for us to enter the depreciation adjustments into the software. Just a couple things to keep in mind. Okay, so now let's put this piece of equipment on the books from a prior year, and then we'll imagine that we're selling it. So I'm going to go back to our books here and I'm just going to say that this was purchased sometime in the past. So let's say it was purchased in uh, 2000, 2000, let's say, and we're going to say the cost is still 10,000, same method, but I'm just going to then allocate the prior depreciation, the, the prior year depreciation will be, I'm just going to say 6,000, right? So now this was on the books from the last year. This also becomes very important to use the same accounting software because the depreciation schedules are going to complicate things. And if you pick up a new client, getting the depreciation schedules uh, is important so that you can basically enter that into the system. You probably want to make sure that you enter it into the prior software to try to match up the depreciation perfectly and then perform it forward to the current year to try to get the rollover as best you can situated. In any case, this is the 10,000. This is the depreciation. Prior year depreciation we're imagining is 6,000. So the current depreciation, this is, we're using basically a double declining method for the maker's method. We'll talk more about that later, but that would be the current year depreciation. So still on the current year uh, schedule C, we would now have depreciation that's being allocated for something purchased in uh, the past because we're trying to allocate it to the, the time period that it was consumed. Now we're gonna imagine that we sell that piece of property in uh, the current time period. So what if we sold it? So let's say we sold it for $8,000. So $8,000, that's gonna be our sales price that we sold the equipment in, let's say 06, uh, 15 to four to do, uh, uh, and so there we have it. So now if I go back uh, to the software, we're going to say, if I go to my depreciation schedule and we go to the regular depreciation, it's on the books here for, uh, the 10,000. And then in 2024, hold on. I sold it in 2024. We need to sell it in 2023. That's the tax year that we're on we sold it in 2023 so now uh we have it's off of the 2024 depreciation schedule is gone and if i go to 2023 depreciation schedule here's the date acquired and here's the date sold you can see there's been an adjustment to the current year depreciation uh, because we sold it basically in the middle of the year we'll get into those calculations a little bit more later for now, we want to go to this schedule uh, 4797. And so if I go to page two, we have basically our calculation. So we've got the gross profit, uh, the cost or other basis, and then uh, the depreciation. Here's the adjusted basis and the total uh, gain. And then we have the allocation section uh, 1245 gain and so on. So let me try to just give a, a little bit of a summary on this. So let's say we bought it 
for $10,000. We said that the depreciation, if I go back on over here, we could say, let's go to my depreciation schedule, pay the regular was prior years was 6,000 in the prior years, 6,000. And the current year we depreciated uh, 576. So 576, so the total depreciation is gonna be those two. So that means the book value is gonna be this minus this. That's in essence, the book value. We sold it uh, for, what did we say, 8,000? So that means we have a gain of 8,000 minus the book value of the 4,576, which in essence is pulling over here to page two, which they're calling a 1245 property. Now this gets into the issue of, well, where should that gain go? Because you'd think if I, if I go over to the schedule C, you see that we have this deduction here, but we don't have that gain up top in income. It's not being put on the Schedule C. Uh, where is it going instead? If we go to the Schedule 1, we see it right here, line number four, other gains or losses. So now we have this coming from Form 4797, which is going to be part of uh, this going to the 74,000 here, which is pulling into the Form 1040. There's the 74,000. Now, the point of this is that if I go to page number two, you're going to say, hey, what about my tax calculation? Because we sold property, should it be calculated at different rates? And you can see here that we don't have that more complicated calculation breaking out something other than just the, the ordinary income rates. In other words, it looks like it got taxed at ordinary income rates. And you might say, well, why isn't it taxed? It's taxed at capital gains rates. And here's where kind of the issue comes in. If I, if I go back on over here, you could see the argument would be, you know, if it's, if it's a long-term sale, it should be at capital gains rates. But you could see what happened is, is basically the only reason I sold it at a gain is because I over-depreciated it and possibly I over-depreciated it because the tax code is giving us these accelerated depreciations. In other words, if you let me buy a 10 year piece of equipment and expense the entire thing in the first period, you're gonna allow me to get a, a deduction at ordinary income rates. And then if I sell it, then, then I, if, you, if you allow me to take it, I'm gonna have a gain because you let me over depreciate it in the first year. And then when I sell it, I could sell it at a gain, but the gain would be subject to the lower capital gains rates. So you could see how people would play games with that if you allowed that to happen. In other words, over here, the $8,000 is not what I sold it for is not higher than the cost of the property, but it is higher than the book value of the property after I wrote off the depreciation. And so I shouldn't, I sh it, when I wrote off the depreciation, I got ordinary income rates. So the, I, the argument is that, well, you can't then sell it and, 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 and then get a gain, which you obviously are gonna get because you over depreciated it and get favorable capital gains rates. That's why this gain is being taxed at ordinary income rates. Now, most property is going to be in that category where it's gonna go down in value. It's not likely I'm gonna buy a forklift for $10,000, use it for two years, and then sell it for more than $10,000. But if it was a, a building or something like that, that's when that can happen. So let's imagine I sold it then, let's just imagine I did sell it for more than the 10,000. Let's say I sold it for 12,000. So now if I go back on over and say, okay, let, let's imagine we sold this thing for, let's say 12,000. So now I'm gonna go back on over and say, okay, on the schedule C, I still have the depreciation. I don't see the income over here on the depreciation schedule. We of course still have that it is uh, sold at the same time. We still have our calculation. And then on the form 4797, we see the 2000 gain, if any, from line 
uh, 32 now being populated. Let's go to the 4797 part two. So now we have the 12,000 cost through other basis was 10,000. The depreciation uh, 6,576 adjusted basis 3,424. So the gain is now at 8,576. But the 1245 property is at that 6,576. So let me show you that. So if we if this was our cost, right? So now we still have the book value as the, is at that 3,464. We sold it for the $12,000. That gives us a gain of a total gain of 8,576. But 2,000 of that gain was over and above the cost. So 2,000 of that gain was over and above the cost, and therefore the difference is this 6,000. So this 6,000 is kind of, you could think of it as recapturing or basically part of the amount that we over depreciated and therefore should be subject to ordinary income. Whereas this 2,000 is over and above the cost and therefore might have more favorable rates, the capital gains rates, uh, which are, are lower tax rates, which would be better. So, so then we could say, okay, there's the, the 2,000, uh, uh, that is that it's breaking out the eight five seven six minus the six five seven six to do it gives us that two thousand so then if I go back then to the schedule one you can see what's included here only the six thousand five seventy six not the full eight thousand five seventy six that is being included and pulled down to the seventy six thousand which is pulling to the form ten forty which is pulling in here on uh, line number eight, uh, the other amount you can see is right there. The 2000 is being populated on the Schedule D. Now the Schedule D for most individual income tax preparers is associated with the sale of stocks and bonds oftentimes where you have these capital gains and loss rules where you, if, if, if you have a gain, it might have a more favorable tax. So here's the gain that's being pulled in from Form 4797. And that's pulling into the first page of the form 1040. You might say, well, what does it matter if I put it at this 2000 or include it in this 76,000? Why don't I just make this 76,000, 78,000? And the issue is that if I go to page number two, when we actually calculate the tax, you'll see that we have a more complex tax calculation, not just the progressive rates, but now breaking out that 2000 so we can tax it at the more favorable capital gains rates. So that whole thing gets gets fairly complicated, both from a bookkeeping standpoint, as well as a tax standpoint, especially when you throw in this issue of over depreciation because of 179 and special depreciation, which results in the likelihood of selling things at a gain, and then having to deal with the fact that you're going to have to tax part of it at ordinary income and part of it at the capital gains favorable rate and so on. Now it could be that you sell it at a loss, right? So if I sell, if I, if I say my book value over here is the 3000, let's say we sold it for 2000 or maybe we just disposed of it. We didn't sell it at all. We just like threw it away. It became worthless, right? But let's just say we sold it for 2000. So then if I go back on over, we're going to say, okay, the depreciation schedule should be in essence the same. And if I go up to uh, the 4797, now we have the sale, uh, the gross proceeds. Here's the depreciation, 6,576, the cost or basis. And we have the loss of 1,424, which we can calculate over here. We have the same book value, but now I sold it for 2,000. So there's our loss now, instead of a gain of 1,424. So if I pull that on over, so it's like, okay, well, if I have a loss, where does that go? Does that go on the Schedule C as like an expense? No, it's not going to the Schedule C as an expense. If I go to the Schedule 1, we could see it here in line 4. Uh, other gains or losses attached Form 4797, which is netting out against the net income flowed in from the Schedule C to the 68,000, which is now being populated on the Form 1040. So there's the 68,000. And if I go to page two, you could see that we have the back to the normal simplified worksheet. 
In other words, the loss I got to take basically at ordinary income rates, which is kind of nice if you had a loss. Now, again, the likelihood of having a loss is greatly reduced if we were allowed special and 179 depreciation because we would have written a huge amount off at the point of purchase. Once those things go away, if they ever go away and they go back like to normal, then it might be more likely that we have situations when we sell property that we're at a loss. However, you might often see a loss if they like dispose of property, which hasn't fully been depreciated, right? Now that's the general idea. Now the other thing we touched on in the prior presentations is the idea of an installment sale, but we're running a little long, so I don't wanna go into it uh, in detail right now. But just to, just to note that if you're selling uh, equipment over here, then it, 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 it's likely that you might be selling things for large dollar amounts, right? And if you sold it for a large dollar amount, you might say, well, I'm going to sell it and then you can pay me in the future, which means you're, paying, you're, you're receiving it in basically installment payments. In that situation, if you sold a large thing like a $10,000 or like a $100,000 piece of equipment and you would have to recognize the 100000 normally under a revenue recognition principle at the time of sale. But you, you might not have the money to actually pay for it because you've basically financed it because they're going to be paying you in future payments. So then, so you might end up setting up basically an installment sale kind of situation that will then allow you to recognize the revenue basically as you, uh, as you get the payments. That's not a really common thing to happen for many businesses, but could happen, you know, somewhat commonly. So maybe we'll do a presentation on uh, installment sales in the future just to see how that calculation could be set up.